So welcome everybody to the webinar today. The uh, topic of the webinar will be fluid fluid phase separation in a soft course medium. And the speaker of today is Christopher McMinn. As usual, I introduce the speaker for very short and then uh, I leave him the floor. So uh, Christopher McMinn is an associate professor in the Department of Engineering uh, Science at Oxford. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT after uh, which he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Yale Climate uh, Energy Institute at Yale University before joining Oxford in 2013. His research group at Oxford, uh, the Pore Mechanics Lab, uh, is an interdisciplinary team of engineers, physicists, mathematicians, and geoscientists. Uh, the study, uh, they study a variety of problems related to flow, transport, and deformation force media, with applications to in uh, soft material and substrate engineering, subsurface engineering. The common thread uh, running uh, through all of their work uh, is the combination of ma mathematical modeling with high resolution experiments to develop insight into complex natural and industrial systems. Their work has attracted support from the Royal Society uh, the UK Engineering and uh, Physical Science uh, Research Council and the European Research Council. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce, uh, that I introduced and uh, that I give the floor to Christopher McMinn. So Chris, I stop sharing my screen. Maybe you can share yours. Can you see yeah. There we go. We see your screen and full screen. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be here virtually and to tell you about some work that we've been doing on. Um, so I'm going to talk about fluid fluid phase separation in a soft porous medium. And I'll explain to you what all of that means, but it'll take me a little while to get to the, the phase separation part. Um, first, I want to talk about the soft porous media part, which is really a main theme of what we're doing in my group these days. Um, so I, we call my lab the Poor Mechanics Lab at Oxford in the Department of Engineering Science. Uh, and the first thing that I should do is sort of thank the, the people who've been involved in this research in addition to myself. So um, my longtime collaborators, uh, Sung Yan Lee and Bjorn Arsandis have been involved in various bits of the work that I'm going to tell you about. And then the um, various students and postdocs uh, who are featured here have been responsible for most of the actual hands-on stuff that I'm going to show you, including the both the experiments, the modeling, and the simulations. Uh, in particular, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about Oliver Pollan's work, uh, as well as experiments that were done by, sort of started by Jeremy and Robin and finished by Fung. Um, so, uh, but everyone here has had some important contributions to, to this stuff. And uh, the work has been supported by the ERC and also the Royal Society and the uh, UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, whose uh, logo didn't make it onto the slide, unfortunately. But, uh, I'm also grateful for their support. So um, what we do in my group generally uh, is we study systems that involve uh, one or two fluids and a solid. Uh, and we're interested in how those materials interact with each other. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways. But one of the main themes is the idea of using mathematical modeling combined with what I like to call high resolution experiments to try to understand how these systems behave. So this video, uh, this slide is showing you two videos of experiments that are sort of in this spirit. Um, the video on the left is, so they're both radially outward fluid flows in a quasi 2D system. So fluid is coming in the center and flowing radially outward toward the edge. Um, in the video on the left, the flow is a liquid. Uh, the whole system is saturated with liquid. So there's only one fluid phase. And then there are small solid particles, which are squishy. And so there's a fluid pressure gradient as the fluid flows through this packing of beads and out at the rim. And that pressure gradient actually deforms the packing of beads outward against the edge because the beads are soft. So this is uh, a nice illustration of what's called poroelasticity. So the deformation of a porous material due to fluid flow through it. Uh, and the thing that I think that's interesting here is that it, this experiment would actually be very boring if the beads weren't soft because it would just be straight up radially outward flow of fluid from the center to the edge, you wouldn't be able to see anything. And really there wouldn't be anything interesting to see. So it's really the coupling mechanically between the fluid and the solid that makes this experiment interesting. Uh, on the right, this is flow in what's called the Healy-Shaw cell, which is the gap between two parallel plates. Uh, a traditional Healy-Shaw cell, uh, in a traditional Healy-Shaw cell, those plates would both be rigid, 
Um, but in this particular one, one of the plates is coated with a thick slab of soft elastomer. And so the consequence of that is that the fluid pressure can actually locally expand the gap thickness that the fluids are flowing through. So what you're seeing here, uh, the flow cell is initially full of air, so it's dry. And what we're injecting is a viscous liquid. So this is like the inverse of traditional viscous fingering. Uh, the fluid coming in is much more viscous than the fluid that's already in there. And so if, if nothing else were happening, this interface would remain a circle and would grow until the viscous fluid fills the whole flow cell, and that would be that. So this experiment would also be very boring, uh, if not for the fact that there's this mechanical coupling between the fluid and the solid. And the consequence of that is that the solid deforms where the fluid viscosity is high, or in the viscous fluid where the flow rate is high, uh, and it deforms so much that the gap actually closes at some point. So you can see right there, now in this region, the gap between the two plates has actually closed because the, the elastomer has bulged upward out of the way in the injection area and has bulged downward just outside that area to conserve its volume. And in order to keep advancing, now the injected fluid has to advance this layer, uh, this sealed layer where the elastomer is actually touching down on the bottom plate. And what you get is a pattern that actually looks a lot like classical viscous fingering. But again, this is from, from the perspective of sort of a two fluid phase flow, this should actually be viscously stable. So if not for the elastic deformation, uh, we would see a circle. So these are, again, two examples of experiments where uh, we're getting sort of interesting non-trivial patterns and other things happening because of the coupling of the fluids and the solid. And what makes them, in my mind, high resolution is the fact that in both cases, we can actually infer a lot qualitatively and quantitatively about what's happening by image processing. So in the case on the left, we can follow the particles by using individual particle tracking and calculate a displacement field. And in the case on the right, since we've dyed the invading fluid, we can actually use the local brightness of the invading fluid to measure quantitatively the gap thickness in that region. And so what that looks like, here I'm showing you the radially outward deformation field or displacement field within the particles. Uh, and here I'm showing you the local gap thickness within the invading phase. And so in both cases, you can see that this is telling you a lot more about what's going on uh, in terms of how the fluid interacts with the solid and the mechanisms that underlie the formation of these patterns. So I'm not going to talk about any of the details, um, but the point is that uh, this is the sort of game that we like to play, really. This, these are the sorts of problems that we like to look at and also the, the methods that we like to use. So from there, I want to transition to thinking about what I mean when I say a soft, porous medium. So uh, I understand a lot of people in sort of this community are not used to thinking about porous media generally. So I'll try to go slowly and kind of build from there. Um, so when I talk about poro mechanics, what I, what I mean is that it's the coupling between flow and deformation in a porous material. So a porous material is sort of any collection of particles or fibers or anything else where there's a porous solid structure where the pore space is connected. And so the fluids can flow through it. Uh, so in a deformable porous medium, uh, deformation can drive fluid flow, meaning that if you squash the material, the fluid will flow out, for example. And that's true of any porous material. So I could take a sponge, which is very soft, and squash it, and the fluid will leave. Or I could take a rock, which is fairly stiff, and crush it, and the fluid will have to leave. Um, but the other thing that can happen is that fluid flow can drive deformation. And that is something that only happens in a porous medium that is soft. So that can only happen when the pressure gradient in the fluid is comparable to the stiffness of the material, whereas driving deformation with fluid flow is sort of a whole different thing. So we can make that a little more quantitative uh, by defining a concept that I like to call the deformability, which measures the strength of the two-way coupling between flow and deformation in this porous material. So I'm going to call that curly D here for deformability. And in general, that's going to be the ratio of uh, some pressure gradient, which is sort of how strongly fluids are pushing on the solid to some sort of stiffness, say, which is how much the solid is able to resist that deformation. So if the deformability is large, then that means that the sort of fluid pressures are large relative to the solid stiffness. And so we expect to get large deformations driven by the fluid flow. And if the deformability is very small, that means that we don't expect to get sort of meaningful deformations in response to the fluid flow. So that's essentially sort of a rigid or undeformable porous material. So for example, if your pressure gradients are coming from viscosity, then you might scale the size of those from Darcy's law. So sort of the viscosity times the fluid flux times the length scale of your system divided by its permeability. Permeability is just like the, conduct the conductivity of the skeleton to fluid flow. Uh, 
And in that case, you could have a viscous deformability, which measures viscous pressure gradients relative to the stiffness of the material. And again, if that quantity is large, we expect lots of flow-driven deformation. And if it's small, then we don't. So when I say soft porous media, what I mean is porous media that are highly deformable. Uh, and one thing to bear in mind about this deformability is that it's a function of a lot of things, right? So it depends not just on the medium. So the stiffness is really the only property of the medium that's, that's featuring here. And clearly, if the stiffness is very small, then I expect the material to behave in a way that's fairly soft. But it also depends on the properties of the fluid, so the viscosity, and the properties of the flow. So there's the, the volume flow rate, or the, say, the fluid flux, and the size of your system, and, all, and also, of course, the permeability, which is also a property of the solid, but not related to its mechanics. Um, the permeability of the solid is also very important. So it's really a system property rather than a property of the fluid or the solid by themselves. Uh, so these soft porous media are ubiquitous. Uh, things like soils and sediments are very soft. Things like cells and tissues are very soft. Things like gels are actually soft and porous, and also things like filters, and I'll give lots of other examples over the course of the talk. So really, we'd like to understand how flow works in these kinds of systems. So this is my favorite example of a soft porous medium. This is a, a piece of a kitchen sponge. So it's a cylindrical core of a kitchen sponge, and you're looking at it from the side. And what the researchers have done here is they put it in a transparent tube. So this is the tube vertically here. And there is a rigid metal mesh down here on the bottom, which allows fluid to pass through, but it doesn't allow the sponge to pass through. So there's like a zero displacement condition down at the bottom. So this is in the relaxed state. Nothing is happening. And you can see that there are these black tick marks on the side of the sponge. So the first thing that they do is they compress the sponge with a piston. And when you do that, the fluid moves out of the way, of course. Uh, and the sponge gets squashed. You can tell that it's squashed because it's macroscopically shorter, but also because the tick marks got closer together. So that's a measure of the internal deformation or the strain within the material. And although the tick marks got closer together, they're still uniformly spaced. So that tells you that this deformation is, although it's fairly large, right, it's many, say, tens of percent, uh, it's fairly simple in the sense that it's a uniaxial state of stress and strain. The stress is uniform in every cross-section and, so, and the strain is uniform within the material. Um, so then the second thing that they do is they take this piston away and now they drive a steady fluid flow through the sponge from top to bottom. And when you do that, the sponge gets squished just like it did by the piston, but now this deformation is fluid driven. And the key distinction between the sort of mechanically driven deformation and the fluid driven deformation is that the state of strain within the material is highly non-uniform in this case. And that's because any cross section essentially has to support the net viscous drag on all of the material above it, which means near the bottom, you have to support essentially the entire viscous drag across the, the whole material and the, the material is very squished. But near the top, the material is nearly relaxed because the fluid has only just entered. So you get a very strong, um, strongly nonlinear deformation profile. Uh, which is kind of a hallmark of these fluid driven deformations. So the question is, if you wanted to predict macroscopically, say the distribution of these tick marks, what would you need to do? So the first thing you need to do is to characterize the mechanics. So this is for, uh, from a different paper, um, but where I think the, the plots are a little bit nicer. Um, the stress strain behavior of one of these soft sponges. And so what they're plotting here is stress versus strain. Uh, there's an initial compression where this the sort of strain is increasing and the stress increases with it. And then there's a hysteresis loop where sort of here the, here the strain is reduced and the stress reduces along back down, not quite to zero. So there's a little bit of irreversible deformation. But then after that, as you increase the stress again, you follow a different path on up. And then you can go around this loop sort of as many times as you want. So this is a you know, fairly standard um, stress strain curve for a complex material. And there are a few things to note. So first of all, the loading is quasi-static, meaning this is there's no dynamics here. It's purely just measuring the stress at a fixed strain with nothing else happening. Uh, the material is clearly quite soft. So these stresses are, you know, sort of um, a few kilopascals, which, which means this really is something, you know, imagine like the sponge in your kitchen. That's the sort of material that we're talking about. The material it has a nonlinear uh, constitutive behavior. So for a linear elastic material, you would just get a straight line. And in fact, this one probably is linear elastic at small strains, um, but the strains here are quite large. So you can see the, the strain is going up to sort of 70%, nearly 70%. So it's a very large strain we're applying. And of course, then we do expect nonlinear stress strain behavior, which is exactly what we get. 
but the material is elastic, meaning that it returns more or less to its initial state, accepting this small amount of irreversible deformation from the first cycle. And of course, this uh, deformation loop is hysteretic, which is, you know, you don't follow the same path up as you follow back down. So that is maybe a little bit complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So this gives us a stress strain curve and you can convert kinematically strain into porosity, which is the, the volume fraction of fluid within the material, which means this gives you a curve of stress versus porosity for this particular material. And that's, that's the behavior that you need. So the second thing that you need is the fluid flow behavior. And that is usually characterized in terms of this permeability that I mentioned, which is the conductivity of the material to fluid flow. So this is permeability as a function of strain. Uh, and so the first thing to notice is the permeability is here. If you're not familiar with permeability, these numbers are really big. So 10 to the minus nine uh, is, sounds like a small number, but as permeability goes, these numbers are actually very large. So the permeability of a handful of sand is usually something like what's called one Darcy, which is 10 to the minus 12. So these are thousands of Darcy's. So this material is very permeable. And that's because it's very porous. So again, it's, it's uh, something like a kitchen sponge. And so it's got big open pores with really not that much solid. So it's not that surprising that its permeability is very high. So one question you might ask is, well, how do I measure a permeability if the material is deforming in this complicated non-uniform way when I drive a fluid flow through it? So the standard way of measuring permeability, I should say, uh, is that you apply a fluid flow across the material and then you measure the associated pressure drop and the permeability can be calculated in a very straightforward way from the, um, the pressure drop as a function of the flow rate. So what do you do when the deformation profile within the material is very non-uniform? Well, what you do is you first squash the material mechanically, which as we saw in the previous slide, gives you a, a, simple, not a, a simple uniform state of stress and strain within the material. And then you drive a very slow flow through the material. And remember, if the flow is slow, that's one of the ways that we can make the deformability very small because the flow rate was in the numerator of the deformability. And if the, so if the, if the flow is slow, meaning that the deformability is small, then actually the deformation due to fluid flow is very small on top of the deformation that I'm already imposing uh, by squashing the material in the first place. And so that means these are essentially the permeability at different uniform states of strain. Uh, and that gives me a nice permeability curve, which I can then apply sort of any chunk of the material. And with that, I have everything that I need to write down a continuum model. So I've got a stress strain curve, I've got a permeability curve. This is what a sort of standard continuum model would look like for this problem. This is from sort of 1D large deformation poroelasticity. Uh, and the, the important things to note, so this is a time evolution equation for the local porosity. And the constitutive functions that appear are here. This permeability is a function of porosity, which is the curve on the right that I was just showing you. And this is where the stress as a function of porosity comes in. This is actually the slope of the curve on the left that I was just showing you. So in principle, we would have measured those two functions. And given that, we can then solve this equation and predict, well, this is what we expect for a given flow rate uh, from top to bottom through the material. We can predict the distribution of tick marks. And that's ultimately what we wanted to do. So we've made macroscopic predictions, which means in principle, we've solved this problem. So now we know how to say model and predict what's going to happen inside a soft porous material uh, when there's flow coupled to deformation. So the question is, is that it? So are we finished? And the answer in my mind is no. So this is the problem that we were just looking at. So we had flow of liquid through the material from top to bottom and we wanted to know sort of what was happening inside the material and what was coming out the bottom. So everything was incompressible, which means that the, uh, the flow rate through the whole system has to be constant. So the amount of liquid going into the top has to equal the amount of liquid going out the bottom. Um, but there's a lot of complicated flow coupled with deformation happening in the middle. And now we have a way of predicting what that would be. So this problem we solved. The question that I'd like to ask is, well, what happens if we switch the liquid for a gas? Oop, going the wrong way. There. So we replace the liquid with a gas and we inject the gas now from the bottom. So we've got a mixture of grains and liquid, and we've got gas coming in the bottom, flowing through the system and leaving at the top. So there's a few things that have changed. One is that the gas is a lot less viscous than the liquid. Another is that the gas uh, is going to experience buoyancy. So we've got gravity now, which means that the gas bubbles actually want to go up. Uh, and a third one is that there's capillarity in the system now. So we have two fluid phases instead of one. So the question is, can the approach that we just used for the sort of two-phase problem, meaning a liquid and a solid, 
work for this three-phase problem, where we now have a liquid, a solid, and a gas. So first of all, before we get to that, why should we care about this problem? Is it completely contrived or does it actually matter? So the answer I would say is that it actually does matter a lot. So these sorts of problems come up all over the place. Um, in particular, we have things like marine gas seeps, where bacterial or chemical activity produce bubbles in seabeds or lake beds, and those bubbles sort of grow and rise through the sediment and then escape, as you can see in this video down here on the lower left. These are bubbles of sort of methane or maybe CO2 that are rising up out of the seabed. They're being created by sort of bacterial activity. Uh, and for many, for many reasons, including better understanding ecosystems, but also energy resources and carbon budgets, we would like to understand what the rate of methane uh, venting is from the system and maybe how big the bubbles are, which turns out to be really important for estimating if these bubbles are actually going to make it to the atmosphere or dissolve along the way. Uh, and this sort of thing also happens in industrial waste ponds, uh, where knowing what the sort of the rate of gas venting is is really important for management and safety. And it happens in volcanic eruptions. So in volcanic eruptions, like this cartoon in the upper right, actually a lot of gas exhales from the magma as the magma is rising. And the rate of gas exolution and the ease with which those gas bubbles can then rise out and escape has a really important impact on the buoyancy of the magma, which then has a really important link with the intensity of the volcanic eruption. So actually, although the system is a lot more complicated, uh, the basic physics, uh, or let's say it shares a lot of the same basic physics in the sense that we're going to have three fluid phase or three phases. There's a liquid, a solid, and a gas. The solid is sort of granular. It's actually these crystals of magma that are solidifying as the magma rises, um, or crystals of rock, I should say. Uh, and we need to understand mechanically, both solid mechanically and fluid mechanically, how those ingredients interact with each other in order to make predictions of these sort of important physical phenomena. Um, the last one I'll mention is this picture down here on the right. So these are actually craters in the seabed that were formed by gas, sort of violent gas expulsion triggered by the dissociation of methane hydrates, which I'm not really going to talk about. Um, but the key point is that these craters are huge. So if you look at the length scale, these craters are actually kilometric in size. So we can go from centimetric bubbles up to kilometric craters, depending on what exactly is going on in the system, um, which is yet further motivation for wanting to sort of understand the basics of these problems. So these are some experiments we did a few years ago um, in a, a very simple version of this system. So what I'm showing you here is uh, an experimental system where we have a quasi 2D packing of squishy particles saturated with liquid. And what's changing across these three pictures is the height of the box. So here, the height is fairly low, which means the particles are fairly squashed. And then I'm just raising the lid upward as you go to the middle and then to the right. So it's the same number of particles in all three cases. On the left, they have relatively little room to move around. They're highly confined. And on the right, they have a lot of room to move around. So they're not very confined. And then the question is, if we inject gas in the bottom, how does the migration of the gas through this packing of particles depend on how confined the particles are? So when the particles are very confined, we get essentially invasion of gas through a rigid porous medium. So this is what you might call pore invasion. The gas is going into the space between the particles, displacing the liquid. Uh, and this is sort of a standard kind of flow in sort of the porous media world that um, is reasonably well understood. However, when we raise the lid a little bit and reduce the confinement, we see something completely different, which is that now the gas is actually pushing the particles apart rather than going between them and migrating in these slender pathways that look a bit like fractures. So sort of in every sense, this process is very different from the process that we saw on the left. And if we raise the lid even further, we get something different yet again, which is that now it's so easy for the gas to migrate through the medium that it actually travels through it as if it's a liquid. So we get these fairly round bubbles that look as if they're migrating through a flow cell full of liquid and that rise almost unobstructed all the way to the top. So it's sort of the solid fraction kind of changes the effective viscosity of this mixture that the bubbles are migrating through, but they provide very little resistance to bubble motion. So if we want to model how gas is going to migrate through one of these systems, that means we have to be able to capture all of these different behaviors, which is a sort of non-trivial thing to do. So the reason that this is such a challenging thing to do, and the reason that you should be a little bit maybe concerned for the success of this effort, uh, is that if I go back a step here. So remember, we played this trick before in order to characterize the fluid flow properties of the material, which was that we slowed the flow way down so that the viscous deformability of the system was small. And that way we could characterize it as if it were essentially a rigid porous material. And then we could use that prediction to model a porous material where it's not rigid. 
where it's actually deforming in response to the flow. But in this system, we can't do that. So we actually can't weaken the deformation of the porous material by changing the flow rate because the flow rate is not the thing that's deforming the porous material. So the, the problem is capillarity. So there's lots of systems where capillarity is really important. One is, of course, these bubbles. So in sort of volcanoes or in these soft sediments, so this is an X-ray CT of bubbles in, in sort of actual mud sample. Also in things like kitchen sponges, where you have capillary rise that's sucking a liquid up into the sponge and the sponge is swelling in response, which is sort of a different mechanism, but falls in the same broad category. And even in things like animal fur or textiles, where wetting and drying are really important for understanding, for example, how insulating that material might be to um, cold water. So the problem is that the capillary forces themselves are strong enough to deform the solid. So I should really be thinking instead of a viscous deformability like the one that I showed you before, I should really be thinking of a capillary deformability, which I can define by uh, calculating a rough estimate of the capillary pressure. So it's interfacial tension divided by sort of pore size or grain size or whatever. Uh, and then my capillary deformability is my interfacial tension relative to a length scale times my stiffness. And in all of these systems, that number is not small, and I have no way to make it small. I can't slow down the flow. I can't change the length scale of my system. For a given porous material, this just is what it is. Uh, and so that means that the pore, scale, the pore structure cannot be decoupled from the flow, which means we sort of have a problem if we want to try to characterize the flow properties, or at least we can't play the same trick that we played before uh, with the single phase flow of fluid through the sponge. Uh, and just one point of note, the ratio of the viscous deformability to the capillary deformability is, of course, the ratio of viscosity to capillarity, which is the capillary number, if that's a familiar quantity to you. So the question is, what can we do for modeling this particular problem? So we do understand a little bit about how these systems work. So this is some fairly, let's say, classical work at this point from um, Anton Jane and Ruben Juanes, um, where they looked at gas invasion into a, a granular material that's being confined by some confining stress. And they identified that one of two things can happen. So if the capillary deformability is small, meaning the capillary pressure is small relative to the stiffness of the material, then you just get pore invasion, just like we saw in our experiments. And if the capillary deformability is not small, then the gas will push the grains out of the way and open a pathway. Again, just like we saw in our experiments. So this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and in fact, life is a little bit more complicated than this. So this is some slightly more recent work by Bjorn Arsandes and friends. Um, where, so here again, our capillary deformability is increasing from bottom to top. Uh, and what you see is that when the capillary deformability is small, we get pore invasion. So there's sort of classical invasion patterns in rigid porous materials, so capillary fingering or viscous fingering. If the capillary deformability is modest, then we get these thin slender pathways or fractures, just like we saw in the experiments. Um, and if it's large, then we get fluidization, where the, the gas can just push the solid and the liquid completely out of the way, almost as if it were a liquid. And we get these sort of liquid-like, and in some cases, liquid-like uh, invasion patterns, depending on the importance of other things like friction in some of these systems. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this has actually also been studied in the context of gas injection uh, with gravity. So this is some nice work from Valerie Vidal's group uh, in Lyon, where they have for a long time been injecting gas into the bottom of bead packs that are saturated with liquid, where gravity is now in the picture. And one interesting feature of these systems is that because gravity is in the picture, gravity uh, actually makes, is a sort of the source of the confining stress on the particles. So the main thing that's stopping a particle from moving is the weight of the particles above it, uh, which means that the confining stress and therefore the capillary deformability, which is measuring the resistance to deformation, uh, is increasing as you go up. So it's highly deformable at the top where the confining stress is low because there are no particles really sitting on top of it. And it's not very deformable at all at the bottom where the confining stress is high because there's lots of particles. And so as a result, you get this transition in invasion mechanisms from bottom to top. And you also get some evolution of the structure of the material as you inject over longer periods of time. So this is a pretty complicated problem. Um, and we're gonna sort of stay away from the details of that. But the question again is what should we do if we wanted to try to model this system or the one where I showed you the experiments. So this is the one, these are the experiments that we had done which now we can understand again in the context of sort of low capillary deformability, it's like a rigid porous medium, moderate capillary deformability, we get these pathways, and high capillary deformability, we get fluidization. So this is really the thing that we'd like to try to capture. Uh, and you might ask, well, how much does it actually matter? Like if all I care about is the rate at which gas progresses through the, the control volume and escapes at the top, 
maybe I can just close my eyes and, and ignore the details of what's happening inside this medium. You know, do I have to really worry about the details of all these pathways or bubbles or whatever? Maybe the, the flow rate is actually about the same regardless. Um, and so this is a plot of the average air volume in the flow cell as a function of time. So I'm showing you several different things. Uh, the things I want to want you to focus on are the solid black line, which is that average air volume, and then the gray band around the black line. So the gray band is a measure of the fluctuations. So it's sort of the size of the venting events. Um, and what you see is that in the poor invasion regime, so over here is highly confined. The horizontal axis is the inverse of capillary deformability. When the system is highly confined, um, we get a certain behavior. Uh, and then as we transition from poor invasion to pathway opening, the amount of gas in the flow cell at any given time increases dramatically. So by a factor of almost three, uh, and so does the size of the venting events. So here we're getting <clears throat> a fairly small amount of air trapped in the flow cells at any given moment and fairly small, oops, fairly small fluctuations in sort of the, the air entrance and expulsion events. Whereas here we're getting really big fluctuations in how much air is in the flow cell at any given moment. And that amount of air on average is much bigger. And then as we transition to fluidization, we actually drop back down again where we have sort of somewhere in between in terms of the amount of air in the flow cell at any moment and somewhere between in terms of the size of the venting vents. So actually the details of what's happening in the box do really matter for macroscopic observables, like how, how rapidly gas is vented and how gas propagates through the system. So it's not something that you can completely ignore. So finally, that brings us to this question of what do we actually do about this? Um, and the answer from my perspective is that we need to sort of change the way that we think about the problem a little bit. So when we inject gas into a porous system, so this is a, pro a box just like the one that I showed you before. So here's a gas bubble rising through. And then what we do is in this one, we have an adjustable piston. So we, we move the piston down, which increases the solid fraction and makes it harder for the gas to push the beads out of the way. And that actually stops the gas bubble from migrating. Uh, now we've got a gas bubble that's trapped in the pore space. If we now squeeze the packing more, what's gonna happen is that the gas is eventually actually going to enter the pore space. So we have these two possible states. The gas can be in an open cavity, which was in this sort of low confinement or high deformability regime, or we have gas in the pore space, which is in this sort of high confinement, low deformability regime. And by changing the amount of confinement, we can actually change which one the gas will do. So in a sense, the gas is actually choosing between two different states. It's deciding whether it wants to be in the pore space or to open a macroscopic cavity in the packing. And which one of those it chooses is between the gas and the liquid and the solid. It's not something that we can impose, um, but it's gonna be the state that has the lowest free energy. And which state that is depends on the conditions. So as you can see in this movie, really the thing that it's depending on in this case is the confining stress. So as I increase the confining stress, the gas actually transitions from one state to another. So I can think of this whole thing as a process of thermodynamic phase separation, where the gas can either be in the pore space of the porous media, meaning sort of mixed with the liquid and the solid, or separated from the liquid and the solid. And it chooses which of those it wants based on this thermodynamic state variable, which is the confining stress. And of course, also based on the properties of the system. And so once you sort of make that change of perspective and think about this as a process of phase separation, you can draw on a lot of the tools that people have used to think about phase separation in the mechanics community and in the physics community. So in particular, now I'm gonna show you a lot of equations over the next couple of slides, so uh, don't worry, <laughs> but um, I don't want you to worry too much about the details. I'm just gonna show you sort of the rough idea of what we're doing. Um, there is a machinery for developing what are called mixture models uh, for three phase mixtures that cap capture the physics of phase separation. And people have captured in previous work, a lot of the different ingredients that we want. So the presence of multiple phases, the presence of solid phases uh, mixed with fluid phases and the physics of phase separation. And so really all we have to do is put the ingredients together in the right way. So the sort of fundamental ideas are mass balance, uh, so this is the conservation of mass for three phases. So phi is the, sol the volume fraction, and we have three phases, the solid, liquid, and gas. We have conservation of momentum, uh, where we do that in terms of mixture properties. So there's the mixture density, which is the, vo the volume average density, and then there's the mixture velocity, which is the volume average velocity. Uh, and I should say, in this 
sort of derivation, if you are familiar with these sorts of things, it's useful to know that we're assuming that the phases are individually incompressible, meaning that the density of each phase is constant. Uh, and so then we have energy balance, where we have sort of the kinetic, the time rate of change of the total energy of the system, the divergence of the energy flux, the work done by internal stresses. And then this is sort of the new ingredient that comes about from the work of Girton from the 90s. Um, the idea here is that we introduce a quantity which is called the vector microstress. And the sort of contrivance with this quantity is that it is the quantity that is power conjugate with changes in composition. So stress is power conjugate with velocity in the sense that if you essentially, if you multiply stress by velocity, you get power. Um, the idea is that the microstress is power conjugate with the rate of change of composition. So if you change the composition locally, that takes some subscale forces that are not resolved in your, your sort of continuum model. Uh, and you can include those in your energy balance. And doing that turns out to be very powerful. Uh, so the last thing you have to balance is, is entropy, uh, which you can do with a clausius duhem kind of relation, which basically says that the time rate of change of entropy has to be positive. Um, so you, you can't reduce the amount of entropy in the system. And then you can put all those ingredients together uh, in terms of a Helmholtz free energy. And then if you do that, you can get a macroscopic model for the interaction of these three phases uh, that is mass conservative, momentum conservative, energy conservative, satisfies the thermodynamics, and provides the sort of mechanics of phase separation. So there's one thing you have to do first, which is that you have to, you have to specify a constitutive form of this Helmholtz free energy. So what people typically do is you do that in an additive sense. So the free energy, the total free energy is made up of several different pieces. One is the bulk free energy, which is basically just the free energy of each phase individually. Then there's a mixture free energy, which is the free energy due to the mixing of phases, which the phases may like or not like. So for example, gas doesn't like to be mixed with liquid and solid if the gas is non-wetting to the solid skeleton. Uh, there's an interfacial energy, which penalizes the formation of interfaces within the system. So phases don't necessarily like to be next to each other. Uh, and macroscopically, phases in this context are represented by gradients and volume fraction. So a place where this gradient volume fraction represents a transition between one phase and another phase. So that's like an interface. And then lastly, we can introduce some sort of energy associated with the deformation. So in this case, for example, we think of an elastic energy. Uh, and that's essentially a standard strain energy density. So if you're used to solid mechanics at all, this is just a strain energy density function that you can pull out of you know, large deformation solid mechanics literature. Um, and that's typically going to be a function of some quantity having to do with the deformation of a solid skeleton. And it's kinematically related to the local solid fraction. So this is the Jacobian determinant, which measures the local volume change. And it's related to how much the solid fraction changes locally in the pore skeleton. So all of that being said, if you put all those ingredients together, and turn the crank, then you can generate this model for a three-phase mixture, which has, again, conservation of volume. So that's totally standard. Um, it involves Darcy-like flow. So we have a Darcy-like flow of, say, the liquid or the gas relative to the solid, which is has to do with a permeability, which is a function of the solid fraction or of the local volume fraction, the viscosity of the phase that's flowing, and the gradient of a chemical potential so this looks just like Darcy's law, except that here we've got a chemical potential. And that chemical potential is a pressure plus a contribution that you can think of as a capillary potential. So essentially, the chemical potential is the pressure of the phase, but the pressures of the different phases are different by something to do with capillary forces. Then we have the free energy function that I just talked about, a statement of mechanical equilibrium, which says that the divergence of the total stress in the mixture has to vanish. We have an expression for the mixture stress, which is that it's equal to minus the pressure plus an effective stress plus something called the Cordovec stress. So this is very much like standard sort of bioporoelasticity. This is Terzaghi's effective stress, which is the thing that's related to the deformation of a solid skeleton. So this again is straight out of hyperelasticity, for example. The, the stress in the solid skeleton is related to the derivative of the strain energy density with respect to the deformation gradient tensor. Uh, and then this cordovic stress is a stress, again, due to the presence of interfaces. So it's sort of a capillary term in some sense, or it sort of kind of rolls together capillarity and wettability. Uh, and so that has to do with how the gas bubbles can deform the solid skeleton differently than the liquid does. So that's 
the model. And I'm not going to go into the theory in any more detail. So I think I'm done showing you equations, but I wanted to give you sort of the flavor of where it comes from and the fact that it's actually derived from a thermodynamic framework, which I think is nice. But then the question really in my mind is, does it actually do what we want? So can this model actually capture the motion or the interactions of these three phases in a way that would let us, for example, start to talk about what's happening inside of this box where we have gas bubbles and liquid and beads doing complicated things. So the first thing that's useful to do is to think about two two phase model problems. So this is a simulation where there's no solid. This is just a liquid mixed with a gas, which of course is a simplification of the model that I just showed you, which had three phases. And what happens when you sort of start the clock is that the liquid and the solid spontaneously phase separate. So you go from a mixture, I was, I was plotting here, by the way, the gas fraction, and it was about 50%. Um, and what happens is that it spontaneously for, uh, separates into domains that are gas rich, which are bubbles, and domains that are liquid rich, which is liquid between the bubbles. Uh, so this is sort of classical phase separation um, from a con Hilliard style model, essentially, which is what our model becomes in this limit. Um, it's often called spinodal decomposition. So this is sort of exactly what we should expect for this particular model and this limit. So that's, that's good. Um, another limit that's interesting is when you forget about the gas and just worry about the liquid and the solid. And so in that limit, what you have is liquid flowing through the solid skeleton. There's no incentive for phase separation because the liquid and the solid like each other. Um, but there is the potential for poroelasticity because the pressure gradients in the liquid can deform the solid. So this is the thing we talked about way back at the beginning of the talk, the fact that there's some non-negligible viscous deformability in this particular system. So the model problem that I'm gonna show here is where we start with a solid fraction um, that is fairly high on the sides and basically zero in the center. So this is like a liquid cavity in the center of a porous medium, which is compressed on both sides of the cavity. So the, the sort of rest, relaxed solid fraction in the system is about 0.5. So what we've done essentially is we've reached into the porous medium and pulled it apart to make an opening that is entirely liquid. And then we let go. And the question is what happens? So what happens is that that, is that, that cavity relaxes and it relaxes in a way that's exactly described by sort of standard poroelasticity theory. And, in, and it, um, in fact, in this limit, our model is actually a diffuse interface formulation of standard large deformation poroelasticity, which you can show rigorously. Um, and we've done a little more quantitatively in the context of a slightly different model problem. So that's sort of useful in and of itself. Um, but for purposes of what I'm telling you now, it's really just a, a benchmark to show the model is doing the right thing. So it's got phase separation, meaning that the gas and the liquid don't like to be mixed together. Uh, and it's got poroelasticity in the sense that pressure gradients in the liquid can deform the solid. And so the question then is if we put these things together, if we mix the three phases, does it actually capture phase separation? Uh, Satya, I see a question. Uh, yeah, so uh, the second case that you were showing the liquid and the solid phase, so is it a reversible? Uh, yes, so the, we, uh, we're modeling the solid as being perfectly elastic, meaning that all the deformations are reversible. Um, we're actually using a damage model to capture the fact that you can form actually open cavities in the solid, meaning the solid can support compression but not tension. But all that damage is reversible. So the cavities can close and then it's like they were never there. Does that make sense? Revert, yeah. Can you reverse back the mechanism? Like uh, you have created a cavity and then allowed it to relax uh, spontaneously and see what's going to happen. But from yeah. the relaxed state where you have like 0.5 solid fraction everywhere in your mm -hmm. domain and then try to uh, impose some force which could be a pressure driven flow or something does it yeah, yeah. Heavy? because that's the starting uh, of your experiment that you were showing right absolutely yeah so th this is actually a lot like the radial experiment that i was showing like the video on the left way back at the beginning of the talk where there's a fluid flow that's pushing the solid out of the way and squeezing it against a, an outer wall so in this case this is not radial but it's the same sort of thing if you were to start from the initial condition, which is at the end of this movie, where the solid is basically uniform, and then imagine that you have a fluid source in the center of the domain. So you switch on fluid injection being outward from uh, center to the left and center to the right. Then what would happen would be, it's essentially like playing this movie backwards. You would see the spontaneous formation of this cavity that would look a lot like that. <clears throat> so it is absolutely reversible. Um, in this particular problem, and maybe this is part of the subtlety of what you're asking, is it uh, exactly time reversible? So is the relaxation of the cavity 
the same as the formation of the cavity. If you were to sort of play one of those backwards next to the other one, they look exactly the same. And there, I think the answer is no. That's because of the sort of nonlinear nature of the problem. So the sort of the way that the stress and the pressure interact with each other going in one direction is a bit different than how they interact going in the other direction. But the final, let's say the beginning and end states are exactly the reverse of the two. So you can go forward and backward without losing anything. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a good question. Uh, so then, as I was saying, the question is, if we combine all of these ingredients together, do we actually get the behavior that we want? So this is a three-phase mixture. I'm showing you the solid fraction, which is 0.5, and the gas fraction, which is about 0.25. Uh, and the question is, do we get phase separation in the context of a stiff solid skeleton? And the answer is no, which is exactly what we want, to be clear, um, because if the solid skeleton is stiff, then that's a system that has a relatively low capillary deformability, uh, which means that we actually expect the gas to stay in the pore space because it's too energetically expensive for the gas to deform the solid. So even though the gas doesn't like being in the pore space, the system overall likes the solid being deformed even less. And so it doesn't happen. But then if we make the solid soft, this is the same initial condition, but for a much softer solid, what we see in fact is exactly what we want, which is spontaneous phase separation. So we get the formation of gas rich cavities or bubbles separated by regions where the solid is being squished. Uh, and that's where all the liquid goes as well. So we've got a, about, you know, say, I don't know, 65% um, solid. The rest of the pore space there is full of liquid and then nearly 100% gas and cavities in between. So that's exactly the phase separation behavior that we're interested in. So just in terms of proof of concept, that's really good. Um, you can, of course, can then get a lot more complicated. Uh, a lot more technical and do a lot of analysis on this problem. And we, we've been starting to work on that, but we've really only scratched the surface, I would say. So one sort of first set of results. Uh, one thing you can ask is, well, we saw that if you have a really stiff skeleton, then you get no cavities. That's this picture here on the left. Uh, so that's the low capillary deformability. If you have a really soft skeleton, you get a bunch of cavities. That's sort of the picture on the right, which is a high capillary deformability. But you can actually vary the capillary deformability continuously and look at how the, let's say, the characteristic cavity size depends on the deformability of the system. So that's what this plot is showing you. It's the cavity size versus the capillary deformability. So if the deformability is too low, below a threshold value, you get no cavities. Uh, and above the threshold value, then there's a pretty sharp drop and then a fairly constant high deformability value for a wide range of deformabilities after that. And so what I'm showing you here are actually two separate things. One is um, results from simulations. So we run a whole bunch of simulations for slightly different initial conditions for the same deformability, and then we average the results. So there's sort of the average value is the dashed line, and the, the sort of standard deviation is the gray bar. Um, and then we can also do linear stability analysis on this problem. So go back to the actual equations and do you know start with a a base state and then perturb it and look at what the system predicts. And it turns out that the most unstable mode from those from that stability analysis agrees really nicely with what we get from the simulations, which is kind of surprising if you know anything about stability analysis. It's actually fairly rare that the most unstable mode agrees so well with sort of the final scale that you see in the problem. But in this case, I think the reason for that is that the most unstable mode is going to, it tells you where the cavities start to form. And once the cavities start to form, that's where they form. And so uh, it gives you, uh, you know, there's not, there's no sort of um, tip splitting or branching or merging as you see in like, say, viscous fingering problems. Um, it actually, you know, the length scale that it starts to form at is the one that gets locked in as soon as the, the formation sort of develops. So I think that's one of the reasons that this agreement is so good. There's a lot more we can do. Um, and this is really the PhD work of my student, Oliver Pollan. So um, we, his first paper on this uh, problem, which contains pretty much all the stuff that I just told you, uh, was published very recently. So you can find that in the Journal of the Mechanics and Physics of Solids if you're interested. Uh, and he's currently working on various other aspects of this problem, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. So just to summarize, um, the idea is that strong capillary deformability is a big challenge for characterizing soft porous materials because the flow and the structure are strongly coupled in a way that you can't decouple. So you need a model that actually captures this coupling. And in particular, it captures the fact that the gas can actually choose to exit the pore space altogether and form these macroscopic cavities. I think that's an essential ingredient in any model that's going to try to capture this problem. And really, the, the thing is that the pathways and mechanisms that you get once you have that feature are completely self-selected. 
So whether you get fractures or open bubbles or whatever else is, is decided internally by the mechanics and thermodynamics of the system. And that's why you need those things to be built into your model from the, from the first, uh, in the first place. So the gas is really choosing or the non-winding phase, which by the way, doesn't have to be a gas. We've just been focusing on gas and liquid, but it could just as well be two liquids, for example, um, which has a lot of other interesting applications. Um, it can choose between two states, which is in the pores or it can form cavities. Um, and we developed this three phase mixture model, which is what you'd call a phase field model um, that captures exactly this sort of distinction between gas being in the pore space and gas being in the cavities, as well as the spontaneous formation of cavities. Um, we are doing detailed benchmarking and analysis of that model right now. Um, and the idea is that that can help close the loop with constitutive behavior. So the question is, what are the constitutive functions that need to go into that model if you want to make quantitative predictions about real systems? And that was really the sort of the theme of what we've been talking about. So if I want to predict what my soft porous material is going to do, then I need to measure the constitutive properties, like the stress as a function of strain and the permeability as a function of, say, porosity. Um, and there are more constitutive functions when you have more phases. So the question is, how do we link the constitutive functions that appear in the model with sort of the ones that actually uh, describe the system that we're interested in? So in particular, the next steps, um, things that Oliver is sort of working on right now are pore scale modeling. So developing a, a, a sort of micro scale model that actually thinks about things like interfaces and, and grain deformation um, in order to try to link actual physical quantities like, like interfacial tension and grain size with these sort of upscaled continuum properties that are in the model, as well as more experiments. And in, in particular, he's doing a simpler set of experiments where things are <clears throat> a little bit easier to describe because the number of behaviors that can occur is more limited. So these are experiments that are in quasi 1D instead of being in quasi 2D. Uh, and I'm really excited about both of those things and how they're gonna link back with uh, sort of the modeling that we've been doing. And finally, um, we are also working on the question of how solutes move around in response to the deformation of a soft porous material. So I didn't talk about that in this talk at all, um, but that's also very interesting because I think you can get a lot of non-trivial effects because squeezing the material can uh, change, can drive a fluid flow uh, and both sort of the flow of the fluid and the changing porosity interact with the motion of solutes in a pretty complicated way. So my student Matilda has been focusing on that problem. Uh, and so we'll have more to say about that relatively soon. And all of this is really in the umbrella of um, my ERC project, DEFTPORT, which is about understanding really this coupling of how flow is coupled to transport and deformation in soft porous media. So with that, I think that's everything that I want to say, but I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you very much, Chris, for the very detailed and uh, interesting presentation. So as you said, let's open the floor for questions. So I see Mikael who just... Uh, Probably you want to ask a question, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for really very physically, very interesting um, uh, description. So uh, speaking frankly, for me, this is really uh, the unknown subject. And uh, so what I was looking uh, for, it is the um, not local, parameters which you uh, introduced, uh, for example, local uh, physical parameters or uh, just the local equations. I, I saw that um, the system which you showed um, is like a, um, such a complex system that some effective parameters uh, should be introduced. So that's why uh, I will... Um, ask you a few questions if you uh, allow me, okay? Uh, so, um, for example, um, uh, delta P capillary, you, uh, um, you introduced as a um, uh, surface tension divided by D. And D is the spatial parameter, yeah? And uh, the length scale. And what is D? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, so I would say the, the point is to develop an estimate of capillary pressure, which is representative of sort of the size of the capillary pressure in your system. <clears throat> and uh, arguably the largest capillary pressure that you're gonna get in a porous material is the capillary pressure associated with uh, a meniscus in sort of a, a throat, you know, say between two grains or between two fibers, 
So in that context, D should be a length scale that characterizes the pore size, right? Or the but throat it, size. It's random. It's uh, uh, it's changing. It's uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah of it should be. It should be some effective. You, you know, for example, in turbulence in in, in my yeah. domain, um, uh, there is a laminar viscosity, and also there are uh, uh, dissipative sheets, and the collective effect of all those sheets uh, gives the turbulent viscosity, which is effective parameter. And I think that um, physically, um, the local uh, surface tension um, should give some uh, effective parameter as an effective surface tension. And the this D should be also as a, you know, like a, um, maybe dimension of fractals or um, uh, some, uh, uh, so in statistical uh, sense, it should give you some universality of processes independently on your initial condition or something like that. I, I'm sorry for such a uh, approximative uh, um, terminology. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I agree. I think that there's different ways that you can approach the mm -hmm. idea of these parameters. So I'm, I'm personally in favor of dimensionless parameters that are nominal in mm -hmm. the sense that they are made up of all quantities that we know and control. So uh -huh. this, so this capillary number, for example, uh, sorry, the, sorry, the um, the capillary deformability. All of the things that go into the capillary deformability are things that you know in advance before you do any experiment, right? So you know, you know the interfacial tension, you know the grain size, you know the stiffness of the material, and the usefulness of that is that it's a diagnostic. So if its value is large, then it tells you, well, okay, I expect capillary forces to play a really strong role in deforming the material, and if its value is small then it tells you, well, I probably don't expect capillary forces to play a role in deforming the material. Yes, But it doesn't describe any of the details of what's happening inside the system mm -hmm. during the experiment, right? Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. actually descriptive in terms of the, you know, the length scales that are developing and whatnot in the system. That's something that you have to determine in some other ways. So it's really yeah. a sort of a nominal parameter that you can control as an experimentalist. You know, I can yeah, design an experiment yeah. that has different values of D. Yeah, um, yeah. But I can't control the actual behavior that I get for each of those values. Yeah, uh, really, I, I I agree, and so and uh, there should be really some general uh, uh, length scale, maybe new length scale uh, uh, of your name and so on, so on. So uh, um, also, yeah, I didn't understand your uh, three phase field equations. I'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, because it's the first time I've seen uh, <laughs> well, those yeah. equations, they're, and maybe they're pretty just, substantial. Just a, just a, um, just a uh, uh, small question. Uh, uh, so you resolved the velocity for each uh, phase, yeah? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and uh, the momentum equation is for each phase. No, the so momentum no, this equation is, uh, this is, is a macroscopic momentum balance. So it's yes. not, it's yeah, not the momentum balance, is for yeah. mixture. So yes, that that's means right. that at each point, there is a velocity as a collective results of all momentum fluxes uh, of all components. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And yeah. so uh, done, done. Where is the diffusion? <laughs> Where is the diffusion coefficient for each phase? Uh, for um, for example, in the first equation. Where is the diffusion coefficient? Uh, uh, how, how, ah, no, sorry. It is um, for the velocity and um, for the velocity of each. Um, uh -huh. So what is the pressure then? Uh, the pressure is also for the mixture, yeah? Yes, that's right, it's a mixture pressure. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, okay, and uh, so there is no um, slippery, uh, there is uh, no uh, relative motion uh, of one phase uh, uh, and another, no? So the, the idea is that the relative motion of the phases is something com that comes in through this uh, divergence of the chemical potential. So the, yeah. the chemical potential is sort of the the energy that each phase carries in and out of the control volume relative to the other phases. So this this W is the relative velocity of yes. the given phase to the mixture. 
Uh huh. So I understand. So, but um, in fact, in fact, this relative. Uh, so uh, this, for for example, chemical potential. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something very fast. <laughs> and uh, maybe it is not comparable with the dynamic of uh, uh, with the dynamics of uh, this uh, mixture. Um, uh, so uh, uh, is it um, uh, classical uh, equations or uh, um, is it more uh, well known? No. Yeah, so more or less. So if you, mm -hmm. if you go back and look in, say, the, the references down here in the corner, you'll find most of this. Um, the sort of the novelty in our case is that we're combining the two fluid phases with a solid phase uh, in, and then designing the free energy in such a way that it gives us sort of the, the behavior that we want. But the, the framework, so, you know, writing down these balance laws for, say, you know, a mixture of an arbitrary number of phases, and then putting them together in terms of a Helmholtz free energy to give you sort of evolution equations, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. fairly well established. Um, so depending on how much, how, how much you want to get into the thorny details, yeah. um, the, the paper by Odin in particular is, is very uh, detailed about this process. Uh, so, and so, and for example, you, you simulated uh, and the minimal um, uh, size result is your uh, finite difference cell. And so in, inside yes. the finite difference cell, you have uh, uh, the complex physics, which is not resolved. What to do? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so that's that's actually sort of the trick in a way. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole concept of these vector microstresses ah, is, that, okay. is that these these represent physics that are not resolved uh -huh. uh, in the continuum scale. So the idea is that if I want to change the composition at a point, it's not just about relative motion of the phases. Mm -hmm. There's also some additional sort of incentive or penalty associated with changing the composition that's mm -hmm. captured by this sort of vector micro okay. stress. Okay. And that has to be built into the chemical potential as well. But that's in a way, that's the real trick. And that's the thing that gives you a, a phase field model rather than just a mixture model. Uh-huh. Okay. So, so in uh, just a second, uh, so in a, in a certain sense, uh, this uh, vector uh, microstress is somehow kind of a constitutive equation of uh, uh, of the stress that are known. So it's kind of a way to model them, right? It's, yes, it's sort of a way of including compositional changes in your energy balance, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't say. And so, and um, uh, uh, finally, uh, do you have some uh, statistical information? Because, you know, uh, maybe um, your process uh, will depend on the rate of uh, initial deformation or of something, um, um, the size of uh, whole size of your um, uh, system. Uh, can you give say something about the um, statistical universality of uh, this um, uh, um, penetration of uh, uh, of uh, uh, self penetration of uh, uh, gas uh, in the solid uh, liquid and so on? Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's a good question. In a way, in a way, that's the thing you would like, right? Is you would mm -hmm. like to be able to predict. The bubble size distribution mm -hmm. or the average bubble velocity because yeah. in the end you don't you know if you want to model the rate of gas venting from the from the seabed you don't mm -hmm. really want to have to resolve every individual bubble that's rising up through the sediment in whatever way it's doing that right you just want a macroscopic prediction of the flux mm -hmm. and the yeah. flux yeah. is going to be a statistical thing in the exactly. End. exactly so the i think the philosophy in a way is that this is a model that does resolve all those individual bubbles and in principle, it captures all of the right physics to tell you how big those bubbles should be and sort of what, what migration mechanism or migration rate they have. And if you were to then sort of run that model for a variety of different conditions, you could then generate statistics, uh -huh. which you could then use to develop, you know, sort of more macroscopic estimates. So, for example, just as a very first course thing, you know, this idea of the cavity size or the bubble size. Yeah, yeah. So as you change the sort of the capillary deformability of your system, how big are these gas cavities that mm -hmm. form or do mm -hmm. gas cavities form? These are kind of leading order metrics. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sorry for very naive. No, no, thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So 
I see. Is there uh, are there other questions? I see Satya maybe. Yeah, uh, one <laughs> quick one. So Chris, you said what uh, Oliver is doing currently the looking into the micro scale modeling. Yes. So uh, what do you mean by that micro scale modeling? Is it like looking into the full porous media from micro scale or just looking into individual uh, the porous beads or the deformable bead and its property? So it's sort of a little bit of both. The, the rough idea is that we're, we're trying to put together a toy model, which is in some sense, let's say, um, looking at a single pore, for example. If you have a single pore and gas in that pore, uh, you know, does the gas stay in the pore or does it push the solid grains apart? And if you model, you know, if you design your toy model in the right way, then you can write down some fairly simple analytical expressions for, say, the, you know, the elastic energy, the surface energy, the, the pressure, things like that. And then, and then come up with a model that turns out to actually have a lot of the same features as this much more complicated three-phase mixture model that I was just showing you. And then the idea is that hopefully we can generalize that toy model to the point where it actually makes predictions about sort of volume fractions and how volume fractions or, or you know say stresses or energies would evolve and then compare that toy model with the continuum model to try to say something about how the uh, constitutive functions that appear in the continuum model relate to the more concrete physical quantities that appear in the toy model does that make sense yeah so uh, it's something like if i understand a single pore uh, then considered my full porous medium as a network of many such pores, uh, or maybe a statistical average of right. something. Yeah. That way you are trying to do. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Just feel free to unmute your mic or you can write in the chat. Um, if not, I, I would like to ask a question myself. So uh, it's uh, more about like the kind of classic approach that you showed at the very beginning with the, exper with the three experiments and different, uh, um, and different uh, volume uh, ratio. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you had three videos, uh, one of them in which you kind of get them oh. really, yeah. Yeah, that's this one, right? exactly. yes, yes, exactly. So, uh, the video on the left looks uh, very much like uh, uh, percolation theory or... Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, and the video on the right, it's uh, more like uh, two-phase flow or uh, quite, quite, quite similar to that kind of dynamics, like the continuum dynamics. Uh, I ask myself is if the the... The mixed stress the, uh, a term you introduced could kind of explain how to pass from how to complement the percolation theory such that you kind of bridge the gap between the two. Like when you stay in the in in the middle in the pathway opening. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. So I think. In a way, the key feature that our model has that, like, say, standard two-phase Darcy flow doesn't have uh, is the distinction between the video on the left and the, the other two, which is the fact that in the video on the left, all the gas is in the pore space. And so if you wanted to approach modeling that problem, probably what you would do is you would use sort of the standard modified Darcy model for two fluid phases and a rigid porous material where I don't know if you have any experience with this, but you would try to characterize, say, the capillary pressure function and the relative permeability functions uh, as functions of saturation in the medium, and then that would let you sort of make macroscopic predictions, which work okay. Um, so in some sense, there is already a model for this problem that at least kind of describes what's going on. Although I agree with you that what in this particular experiment, it looks a little bit more like per percolation than like sort of a continuum flow field. Um, the, the key feature of our model is that it captures the fact that a lot of the gas in the middle video and on the right is not in the pore space. Uh, and I would say, personally, the distinction between the video in the middle and the video on the right, to me, at leading order, is really about the difference in the solid mechanics rather than the difference in the sort of the three-phase interactions or the fluid mechanics. Yeah. So this porous medium, because it's granular, 
uh, when you confine it a bit more, it develops a bit more stiffness and also it develops kind of a, a let's say it tends to deform through fracture. So it behaves a little bit more like a brittle elastic material. Whereas when you confine it a bit less, again, because it's granular, it starts to behave a little bit more like a fluid. So the grains can flow and rearrange. So that's the difference between the one in the middle and the one on the right is really in, in a sense about the rheology of the solid skeleton, which is very sensitive to the amount of confinement or to the solid fraction. I think the actual fluid behavior is fairly similar in the two. Although you'll notice that you do get fluids, a little bit of fluid in the pore space here in this one, yeah. which in principle, like the fact that the gas leaves the fracture and goes into the pore space is something that our model should in principle capture. Okay. That sort of answer your question? Yeah, totally. Because uh, that's uh, yeah, actually, that's that that was the first uh, uh, kind of uh, speculation I uh, I had that it was really depending on the solid mechanics because that's quite clear that it cannot be like a, a purely fluid mechanic of a transition from from left yes. to right because that's uh, uh, it really depends on uh, on the actually on, 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 on the topology of the deformation, but also like from the uh, different properties that pores medium get kind of, kind of gets due to, due to the being squeezed or you know, that's uh, very, very interesting action. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think that at the stress strain curve that I showed for the sponge at the beginning, um, as I mentioned, you know, it's not the simplest stress strain curve in the world. It's not just linear elasticity, yeah. but it's a lot simpler than what you see in these videos, right? So <laughs> it's a system that just deforms in a purely reversible way, purely elastically. And as yeah. long as you have that function, that sort of strain energy function that corresponds to that problem, it's actually not that hard to build that into, into this system. I think yeah. these, this material is much more complicated rheologically than that material. Uh, and that would actually be the main challenge if we wanted to take our model and now extend it to this particular set of experiments it would really be about the rheology of the solid not so much i think the fluid stuff is more or less taken care of at this point yeah 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 and i assume like to bridge the, to bridge the gap with uh, like very complex uh, the very complex uh, uh, natural flow you showed before i mean the heterogeneity of the of the medium will play a huge role like like considering uh, polydisperse uh, bits that that kind of complicates quite <laughs> quite a lot the picture so that's uh, okay that very very interesting very interesting yeah. well the the mechanics of granular materials is not exactly a solved problem so yes. <laughs> at some point you have to deal with that but yeah <laughs> yes for now for now at least we can form bubbles Thanks. Can I ask one more quick question? Uh, so uh, I think I might have asked you before also, but uh, since uh, you just told that Oliver is working on the micro scale of this, like the modeling of the, this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, if I understand, as we have understood that you are working for a single pore and then trying to upscale or sort of see what happens if it is your full porous medium is considered of networks of such pores so that the mm -hmm. total volume fraction is uh, preserved, whatever is the for the full porous media. But does uh, the, the size of the deformable particle really matters? Like whether I, you take a polydisperse versus monodisperse sort of deformable porous medium, having the same porosity, like the porosity of the full domain and try to understand from the micro scale uh, any sort of thoughts yeah, on that's, that's a good question. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm fully prepared to answer whether <laughs> how much I think polydispersity matters, for example, um, because you can imagine, uh, and this comes back actually to some of the questions about sort of statistics. The capillary deformability is pretty easy to define, at least in a nominal sense, when you have a single well-defined grain size or throat size. But if you have a very polydispersed medium, then actually there isn't even one single value of capillary deformability, there's more of a distribution. And in that case, it's, yeah, I think many things could get more complicated. So yeah, it's a good question um, and hopefully we'll get there, but we're definitely not there yet. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there are some other questions. I think doesn't seem to 
to be the case. So, oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for the talk and uh, for answering so many questions. As you could see, the, the discussion was uh, uh, very active and uh, your presentation raised a number of, of questions and thank you for uh, for replying to so many questions and uh, for presenting such an interesting topic really thank you again for the invitation it was really a pleasure <laughs> thanks so i wish you a good evening and hope to see you uh, next week thank you thank you francesco thank you <laughs> bye 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 Hi.